In today's show, we recap Sunday's action in the NBA. Some really big news happened. We look at all of the games and all of the implications of those games. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball, on TikTok at redrock underscore b-ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. That's pricepicks.com and the promo code is Locked On. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Six games on. I did a show earlier today. If you haven't seen it, Kyrie Irving traded to the Dallas Mavericks. Go check that out. And then let's just talk about what we need to talk about. Warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> I went early. I went early. I shouldn't have done it then. I might do it a second one. Sorry, no laugh. We'll do it in a sec. Got to remind you, Trade Deadline Show, Thursday, February 9th, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, live on YouTube. The link to it, you will find it at the top of this screen here if you're watching. Very easy to find it on the YouTube channel. Me, Adam King, uh, Zach Hanshu, Matt Lawson. Not sure who else, but that's what we've got on at the moment. Breaking down the trades as they happen. It's going to be a really big day. I know that a big trade happened today, but doesn't mean other stuff's not going to happen and other stuff that might actually be more interesting from a fantasy perspective. So, sorry to get you to do it again. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Kyrie's traded. Talked about it already early. You want the quick notes? I don't think anyone is there to add. I don't think there's any long-term add in 12-team leagues. No, Josh Green is more of a 14 to 16 team league guy. Um, Dorian Finney-Smith, if he's on the wire, sure, but he's going to be a back-end guy. Yeah, Seth Curry loses value. Joe Harris loses value. Didn't really gains value, but he's not on the waiver wire. Yeah, maybe Muxy Kleber, when he comes back, gains value. Cam Thomas does not gain value. He loses a lot of it. Edmund Sumner loses value. Joe Harris loses value. Tony Warren loses value. But there's just so much up in the air. A million um, injuries. Simmons, Warren, Curry... And this is, again, not to take away Cam Thomas tomorrow, big opportunity. No one's there. He's going to go off again, most likely. Um, in, in Dallas, Christian Wood might be back. Luca's out. Kyrie's not going to play. Uh, Maxi Kleber's still out. Davis Bertans is still out. Plus, other trades could happen. So, whatever's happening now, there is definitely no one where I look at it on the Brooklyn or Dallas side and go, man, got to grab this guy because there's just so much still to happen. And it would be a waste, I believe, of a waiver ad. I talked about it on one of my earlier shows today, but I'll reiterate it now. This is the most popular show of the day we, that we usually do about saving your waiver ads. People go, well, Josh, you're never going to make four ads on trade deadline day. There's not going to be four guys you're going to be able to get. And that's probably true, right? I would rather hold it though. I would rather hold my four ads. I'd sacrifice streaming Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's three days. I don't actually care that much. I'd rather hold those ads, see what happens on trade deadline day or with other trades. Or like someone messaged me, hey, Michael Fultz was dropped. Is he worth an ad? Like, yes. That is worth burning an ad on. That is a long-term 12-team league player. It's not... Ooh, I might try Jaden Hardy for tomorrow for Dallas. That's a very different situation. It's the same value of finding someone from the deadline. You still want to hold some ads. But back to my original overarching point with this is I'd rather give zero streams for Monday through Wednesday, see what happens at the deadline. Because you know what happens Friday, Saturday, Sunday? The 30 players, 25 players, 40 players, whoever many it is. I don't know. It might be 10 trades that get done. And maybe it's 30 players or 24 players that change teams, whatever. On Friday, on Saturday, and Sunday... Trade paperwork goes through, physicals get done, and there are waiver streaming options that open up everywhere. Much like what we're seeing tomorrow with Brooklyn, with you know everyone being out or Dallas with everyone being out due to the trade, you have that happen on Friday, on Saturday, on Sunday as well. Plus, you've kept the waiver ads in the chamber for potential season-long um, winning moves that you can make based on the deadline. So yes, I could stream guys for the Mavericks and for the Nets tomorrow. And it would work out for that real short-term situation. But I'd rather hold them, see what happens down the track, and then do the streaming when there's going to be other opportunities across the weekend. Everyone is welcome to do it, whatever they want. That is how I approach it. I will sacrifice three days worth of streams to have that ability to do that on Thursday 
and then stream the final three days of the week. Because if you stream someone Monday, Tuesday, and then use your other ads at the waiver wire, then when everything goes wild across the weekend, when teams are running eight-man rotations, you can't stream because you've got no ads left. There you go. Steph Curry's injured. The way the injury is framed sounds really bad. We know this, this um, interosseous membrane and the tibiofibular um, ligaments. It's not that, that bad. I'm, I'm thinking probably just rules him out for February. Comes, It's not great, obviously. It's not like a, a day-to-day situation. This, to me, is ruling him out of February, and he'll be back in March. The question then comes, do you add Dante DiVincenzo? DiVincenzo will not start. Okay, let's... We, 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 I assume they'll start Jordan Poole, right? DiVincenzo will not start. So the big value that DiVincenzo had last time with Steph was out. You may have forgotten, but Steph was out and Wiggins was out. So DiVincenzo started and was really strong. Now, Dante might play 29 minutes a night, and for the next three weeks, he might actually be a 12-team league player. He pushes higher than, say, like a short-term Cam Thomas or a Jaden Hardy or an Edmund Sumner because there is a chance that this lasts through the middle of March. And in that time, he might be the 110th, 105th best player. That might be good enough. So he'd come really close to breaking my let's make a waiver ad um, situation for the rest of the season versus holding on to the deadline. But he's not going to play 33 minutes a night, I wouldn't think. He's not going to be a starter, Dante. He's going to sit in a bench role where he was playing 27 minutes a night anyway and probably keep going with 27 minutes to 30 minutes a night with DiVincenzo because Poole moves into the starting lineup as Looney did move back into the starting lineup across the weekend. So there's that. Then... There's this Ja Morant investigation that the NBA is looking at where apparently people that he was with confronted people from the paces and shined a laser at them and security was saying that it looked like a laser attached to a gun. I, I don't even know what to make of it. I don't, obviously, I'm not involved in the investigation. Um, that's a clearly troubling story. Whether it's true or not or how much truth there is, I wouldn't have a clue. Ja has obviously been grading on people quite a bit lately. There's always seems to be something with this guy. Always. How much of it is manufactured? How much of it is real? I've got no idea. But this is, if if true, it's a very serious situation, quite clearly. Would that mean that Jar would get suspended? I don't know. He was out today for a wrist soreness. Am I conspiracy theorizing that? I don't think so. I don't think so, but it's weird. And it just adds further to the Tyus Jones luxury stash situation. Would I waste an add on Tyus Jones for week 17? I don't think so. I don't think I would. But it's it's one we have to watch. For the Nets, Seth is out tomorrow. Seth Curry, Ben Simmons is questionable. Tony Warren is probable. So Seth being out and Ben Simmons maybe not playing does obviously help that stream of Cam Thomas and Edmund Sumner. Remember, Sumner does get first crack. And the big game that Thomas had, not to pour water on stuff, it was on 45 usage and 82 true shooting. And let me here state for the record, say that that is not replicable. It, it, there is no chance in the world that that combination of stats is replicable. It's not. So stream him, but I'd hold the ad. Um, for the Spurs, Sohan is out. Vassell is out. Langford is out. But Trey Jones and Keldon Johnson are questionable. Now, if Jones and Keldon both play, it does hurt Malachi Branham a little bit. But I think that Branham and Josh Richardson, if you do have them, that's great to hold them. Again, I wouldn't stream them in. I think Branham might have some value when we hit March as a 12-team league player. I wouldn't prioritize adding him at this stage. But if you are in a situation where you say, screw Josh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to use my um, waiver ads at the start of the week. Then yeah, Branham and Josh Richardson look like really strong ones. Just going to so- I'll circle back in a second to the Kyrie stuff. Kyle Kuzma's out tomorrow. Bradley Beal is questionable. That obviously boosts the value of Denny Avdia. Deeper leagues, it helps Corey Kispert, especially if Beal is out there. But that squish of Kuzma, Porzingis, Gafford on top of Avdia is not existent. If Kuzma's not there, Avdia's going to play 30 plus and the value is going to be there. Cycling back to Kyrie, I'm not sure how much of a change there actually is with Kyrie in terms of fantasy value. I think he probably does similar stuff. I'm not sure how much of an impact there's going to be on Luka. I feel like those two are just going to do what they do. Is there going to be an impact on Durant? Maybe he gets a little bit of usage. I think probably out of the guys that are rostered, the biggest impacts are going to be Spencer Dinwiddie going up and Christian Wood going down. But these guys are all rostered. So we're not making moves or dropping them. Like Kyrie, I think, will stay similar. Luca will stay similar. Durant will stay similar. Claxton will stay similar. 
Wood will go down. Dinwiddie will go up. Finney Smith probably stays about the same because I don't even know if he's going to start. Someone's not going to start in um, Brooklyn. It's either going to be him or O'Neal or Ben Simmons. One of those three players is not starting in Brooklyn. Is there someone else I'm missing there? No, one of those three guys isn't starting in Brooklyn. So Finney Smith value might go up, but it might go well, well down. And other guys who are fringe players like Seth Curry, that goes down. Joe Harris goes down, obviously. But in terms of those bigger names, that's how I see that stuff uh, panning out. Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Price Picks is daily fantasy, but it's not daily fantasy with salary caps. It's not daily fantasy with thousands of people. It's you versus player projections. That's it. So you might see in that game for Dallas, Jaden Hardy might have a points line set at 10 and a half. And you go, all right, let's go. We're going way more than that. Or you might see Dwight Powell at four and a half rebounds. And you go, okay, is Wood going to come back? Maybe we'll go less than that. You put two to six of those individual player projections into a lineup and you can win up to six times your entry fee. It's so easy to do. You do it in under 60 seconds. You can do it in over 30 US states and the majority of Canadian provinces as well. It's not just the NBA though. You can do it for the Super Bowl, for the NHL, for Major League Baseball starting up really soon. Women's college basketball, the WNBA when that starts. Men's college basketball, PGA, NASCAR, golf. That is PGA already. I already said that. Boxing um, and of course disc golf. So download the Price Picks app. Or go to pricepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Pricepicks gives you $100. If you deposit $50, Pricepicks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Okay. Let's look at some waiver wire stuff. Who is the most added player over the last 24 hours? Again, remembering that. Don't add players. I don't recommend adding them. Number one is Cam Thomas up 35%. Just gigantic chasing, which I don't... It's not, it wasn't a bad ad to add him if you did it before things ticked over today because you do have him for the Monday, Tuesday, back-to-back. So that's going to work out very well in the short term, not very well in the long term. Um, Aaron Neesmith up 34%. Yeah, look, his last two games were really good and then today happened because he's Aaron Neesmith. I think you know if you do have him, you hold and he becomes an eminently droppable player when uh, value appears due, the, due to the deadline. Cole Anthony up 18%. Another player that you cannot trust. Stream in for today, no worries. Didn't work. Chris Boucher up 14%. I guess that's streaming for today. Bold Ball up 11%. Why? No, absolutely no idea. Quentin Grimes up 11%. Good stream for today, obviously. Ricky Rubio up 10%. I'd say that paid off, but he's not going to play tomorrow. Hold him. That's a good That's a good droppable player for, waiver, or for trade deadline value. And then Malik Monk up 10%. He's playing really well at the moment, Monk. He probably is worth a 12-team spot. I wouldn't add him, but if I've got him, like these 10% of leagues who have added him, I would hold on. The most dropped player, or most dropped players over the last 24 hours. What are we uh, What are we looking at? Um, number one is Drew Eubanks, down 22%. He's actually appeared on the injury report with a lumbar issue, probable, but he's there. I wouldn't have dropped Eubanks. Killian Hayes and Alec Burks down 17%. I totally understand it. Totally understand it. I, I don't, I wouldn't, care about holding on to Burks. With Hayes, I'd probably give it a little bit more time, but I don't actually care that much either. TJ McConnell, very obvious drop down 13%. Color me absolutely stunned, shocked, knocked me knocked me over with a feather um, that Rui Hachimura is droppable. Um, amazing stuff. Wow, what a what an absolutely crazy situation that is. Down 10% for Rui. Kyle Lowry, down 9%. And you know what? Yeah. Double cheeked up on a Thursday afternoon. Not only is he bad, he's not getting free throws, he's not shooting well, and now he's injured. Yeah, see you later. I don't know how long he's going to be out for, but I actually don't care at this point. Tom Bryant down 7%. How he was still rostered in that many leagues to be held on to, to be dropped now, he's crazy. And then Tari, regular season. That's interesting that people dropped him after he played 25 minutes yesterday, but the 25 minutes yesterday, people were obviously doing their homework. He played 12 minutes of garbage time. They were 40 points down at the end of the third quarter. He played all 12 minutes of the final quarter to get him to 25 minutes. He is not part of their regular plans. He's not, Sorry, that's not true. He's not part of their top seven players. That's not how Silas treats him. And what's going to require to get there is Jabari Smith getting injured or traded. That's really the only path that I see to or Shengun. And I can rule out that Shengun and Smith aren't getting traded. I can't rule out they're going to get injured. But that's realistically, that is literally the only way that Eason has been able to do this. So I get dropping him. Probably wouldn't, heading into the deadline just in case. But I say that, and then I hear myself, and I go, Josh, who cares if Eric Gordon gets traded? They don't play him at small forward. 
Who cares if Jay Sean Tate gets traded? They don't play Tari Eason as small forward. So I say that, and then I just go, oh, all right. The only other way they could get value is if they committed to Jabari Smith starting a power forward and playing backup center and taking Garuba and Fernando out of the rotation completely. And then Eason would get more power forward minutes. But I'm not even really sure that's going to happen. So, you know, I get dropping him. I do. So let's look at the first game. Early games today. First one was the Magic. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I did it again. The Orlando Magic. Um, they knock off for the Hornets, 119-113. Let's talk about what happened here. Jalen Suggs was out. He was suspended for this game. That's his one-game suspension done. Um, Mo Bamba's got three more left because, yep, he's, I think, maybe a dickhead. And he swung on Austin Rivers, so he's going to be out. Not that we care. He's not a fantasy guy anyway, although people still roster him for some reason. Wendell Carter Jr. had 20-12, and 12, or Bunkero, who'd been honestly really, really bad, was better. 22-10-5, but only shot 30%. His field goal percentage is a real problem. So he's a uh, free throws usually, but he was 91 today, which was great. Fultz played 36 minutes, 16 points, five assists, three steals. So his minutes went up because Suggs was out, even though Cole Anthony was there. Anthony played only 20 minutes. He had nine, two, and five. Hmm. I don't know what to make of Cole Anthony. I don't feel like he's a must roster 12 team league guy, but he puts up solid enough numbers occasionally. Like five assists is still okay. I'll have the occasional pop off scoring night. But if he moves into the fourth guard spot, and Suggs overtakes him, then we're not going to deal with that, are we? Franz Wagner is a real buy low for Franz at the moment. He is, I don't, I don't really know what's going on, but he is struggling in a big way. 14 points on 16 shots, one assist, six rebounds. He's 233rd over the last week, Wagner. While Mo Wagner had eight, five, and four in 19 minutes. I don't know why people are still doing this, but why are you holding Bol Bol? Get that garbage out! Eight and four. He's 225th over the last week. And people are still holding John Isaac. But he had his first block for the season. So I guess you can hang your hat on that. Six and seven in 11 minutes. He's running with a really high usage, Isaac, which is not going to stick if he does get more minutes. But how confident can you be in him getting more minutes? Again, I'm the wrong person to ask here because I was never interested in adding him because basically everything we've seen from Isaac so far is exactly how I expected it to happen um, yeah, when, when we heard that he was returning. Hence, I didn't have interest in adding him. And the only way I think you can have him is if you are so far at the top of the standings that it doesn't matter that you're getting the you know a 20-team league value player on your roster. Because that's what he is. Because you can't put him in IR. He's just sitting there as a 20-team league guy. Because he, what's he's ranked 254th this season per game? Like You have to be able to deal with that level of nonsense. And you, then you've also got to be able to have hope that he gets to 23 minutes. And I don't have hope that he gets to 23. Maybe he gets to 18 at the end of March, maybe. Maybe he gets to 20. I, I, I honestly don't know. We know it's the world's slowest ramp up. At least he played 11 minutes instead of 10. But I've never been excited about him in terms of fantasy value this season. It's great that he's able to come back, but I've never thought that he was a priority pickup. And yeah, you know, obviously, the way he's playing so far hasn't really changed my opinion on that. On the Hornets side of things, Lamelo 33 points on 54%. That's awesome. You also had four steals, six triples. Eight rebounds and six assists. That's a really strong game from Mello. And Terry Rogier had 23, three and, 24, three and six, sorry, on some really good shooting. Rogier is stabilizing now. He's back inside the top 80 for the season after just a horrendous stretch to start. Well, PJ, PJ Washington Jr. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. 12 points, two threes, one steal, two blocks. Really racked it up in multiple areas. Now, I think we've got a pattern here for the Hornets, at least for now. And I talked about this on one of the shows the other day, maybe yesterday, talking about the Mark Williams, Nick Richards situation. Oh, hi, Mark. It appears that on a back-to-back, -back, one game it'll be Williams, one game it'll be Richards. So Richards played last game, Williams back in today. Six, four, one steal, two blocks. It's funny how, is it funny? I don't know if it's funny, but I get like misrepresented a, a lot doing this job, which is fine. Um, but a lot of people go, man, you've been telling us to stash Mark Williams all season. Oh, have I? I'm pretty sure that's not true. I'm pretty sure all I've said about that is he's a really good luxury stash guy. And the closer you get to the deadline within a week, I think he should be rostered in every spot. But the likelihood of Mason Plumlee getting traded is still low. Um, Mark Williams is providing 14 team league value at the moment. So it's worth holding and seeing where, where it goes. And yeah, again, he was relatively solid today, Williams. But under no circumstance have I been telling everyone to add and stash Mark Williams for weeks and weeks on end. I just don't think that's true. Maybe I'm delusional. I don't know. The Cockroach, 31 minutes, 10 and 9, a steal, a block. These are the numbers we got from Plumlee very often early in the season. And then he went on that insane run. But 
He's cooled off a little bit here recently. While I don't think you need to hold Jalen McDaniel 7-4-4 four, four, with Gordon Hayward's minutes being ramped up as well. 31 for Gordon. Now he stunk. Six points on 22% with no threes. I still do think you probably want to hold Gordon Hayward. But I'm not expecting any sort of top 100 run from him or anything like that as we move forward. Today's episode, if I could find my right button. Yeah, today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. The best tasting protein bar ever. We love treats. We love them. Delicious treats, delicious snacks. I love it all. But sometimes you don't want to deal with the extra sugar, extra calories, and you want to do something good for your body. Get that protein in. And that's where Built Bar comes in. The delicious flavors, well, they're fueled by being covered in 100% real chocolate. In the past, I used to tell you, go to Built.com, right? You will find these bars where they're low calories and low sugar, but high protein. 17 grams in a lot of these cases. But now you don't have to do that. You can just walk straight into a Walmart, trundle on down to the pharmacy department, and you'll find them just on the shelf in four bar boxes. Coconut puff, cookies and cream, and double chocolate. Or if you're doing your shopping at Sam's Club, they've got the bigger ones, the 13 bar boxes, churro flavor or brownie batter. So go to built.com and check them out there. Go also to Walmart or go to Sam's Club and get yourself your boxes of built bars. Built bar is built different. Second game, Cavs with a pretty easy victory here over the Indiana Pacers. The final score was 122-103. Don Mitchell is uh, he's struggling a little bit. He's Don. He's good. Talked about him quite a bit on the show, saying a lot of the stuff he was doing early season I felt was going to regress. And it took a bit, but we're there. 120th over the last week. I think his groin is bothering him, to be honest. But 19-3-6, 33-percent shooting. A lot of what he did early season was just on un- very, very unsustainably high shooting, and he maintained it for 30 minutes. 30 minutes for 30 plus games. It is coming back to the pack a little bit. Isaac Okoro, I thought was excellent. 20 points for him in 29 minutes. It does help that Lavert is out, but I'm going to be honest with you, he's a much better fit for this team than what Lavert is. And Lavert's 27 minutes are actually useless most of the time. Okoro had 20 points, three threes, two steals. Now, don't get excited too much because he did shoot 78%, which is not real. But his ability to get steals has actually pushed him inside the top 100 over the last week. Again, he's not an ad, but he's at least moving into 16-team league discussion, maybe even 14 as a regular guy. Mobley, 17 and 10 with three blocks, really solid stuff. And Garland had 24, 3 and 6. Allen was all right, 18, 13, but probably a little bit empty around the periphery. I also thought it was not a bad game from Dean Wadey Waite. Six points, two threes, six rebounds, a steal, and a block. And the big thing with him is he and Chetty Osman have taken all of Kevin Love's minutes. Love is completely out of the rotation. I don't know if it's his thumb or what it is, but he's just not playing. Kevin Love is still rostered in leagues, and he doesn't not does not need to be, obviously. Um, and Levert was out here, so where he fits in is he probably just takes Osman's minutes. But I don't think you need Chetty. Uh, sorry, Karis Levert in a twelve team league situation. As as for the ravishing one, Rick Rubio. Um, 20 minutes, 7 points. That doesn't look good. But 9 assists is. And he's been getting really strong assist numbers. He is not going to be useful for every team. And in points leagues, I wouldn't even bother. But in a category league, getting assists off the wire is really tough to do. Again, it's not for everybody. He's not a must roster player. His minutes are low and they're going to remain low most of the time. But getting 5 assists in 20 minutes, that has use in certain situations. So just, just have a look at what he's doing at the moment. It's been impressive. For the Pacers, you know what? I don't know. I don't know what to do. They, are, for some reason, God, God only knows. And even he's probably looking at Rick Carla going, Rick, are you all right? Like, what are, what are you doing with these centers? Daniel Tice, really? 15 minutes. Seven points for Tice with two blocks. Jackson played eight minutes. Jalen Smith even got off the bench for six minutes. It's all stupid. None of these rotation decisions make any sense. And I'm glad they lost by 20 points. They should have lost by 50. You can't really hold on to Isaiah Jackson, and you definitely can't hold on to Jalen Smith. The other thing you can't hold on to is Timothy John McConnell. Get that garbage out of here! As we said many times, we saw him, when Halliburton was playing, be useless for fantasy. And a lot of us... And you know what? Maybe I was probably a little bit guilty of this. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, we'd, we thought that they would continue, or he'd have value when Halliburton came back. But no. 6-5-5 five, and five in 19 minutes, Jack him off. The guy that's really getting hurt at the moment as well by Halliburton returning is Matherin. 9 and 6, 36%, as per usual, just completely empty across the board. He's 196th over the last week, uh, Benedict. It's very hard for me to sit here and say, yes, Benedict Matherin's must roster. None of the numbers would suggest that, and they're trending downwards. 
Duarte was out with an ankle injury. He also missed their last game due to a coach's decision. So I don't, we're obviously not rostering him. And Halliburton had 15, 4, and 11. But it was a big game for Miles Turner, especially when you considered he had foul trouble. He only played 24 minutes. 27 and 10 with one steal and three blocks, while Heald had 16 and 5. Good assist game from Nampard. He's always on that assist stream list that I put out. He had seven of them with six points in 28 minutes. And then Aaron Neesmith, we talked about him earlier, how he was flying. He had six points on 30% shooting with one rebound and no defensive stats. In general, he is fluky. He has the hot shooting nights, but he can't always put it together. He's definitely not must roster. He's okay in a 12-team league, Neesmith, but he's definitely not someone that you have to hold on to. And again, an honest appraisal of your roster will see Neesmith as your worst player or second worst player, which means they are always going to be cuttable, especially with certain things happening over the next couple of days, where even if trade deadline things don't pan out, taking flyers on situations which might pan out is better than holding a nothing like Aaron Neesmith, in my opinion. Sorry to Aaron and his family. Let's go to the next one. Um, The Raptors and the Grizzlies. The Raptors win at 106-103. No, Ananobi, of course. Maybe he returns for their next game on Wednesday. Maybe he never plays for them again. I've got no idea. But you know what? I knew Preston Chu was a fraud. I knew it. I knew he sucked. I mean, he doesn't suck, but he does. He sucks. He's minus 11. And we've seen him be a terrible category league player for his entire career. And then he came back from that ankle injury, and then um, OG went down, and he started putting up good games. And I went, oh, maybe I was wrong. Maybe not. 10 points, 7 rebounds, no assists, 3 steals, 42 from the field, didn't take a free throw. He's 201st over the last week. He sucks. He's bad. And in saying that, even though that is slightly hyperbolic, I would hold until the deadline. But he has consistently been a bad fantasy player, a bad category league player consistently. And honestly, even though there was a little stretch, it hasn't changed. He's still not very good. Boucher was good. 17 and 10, 70% shooting three threes. But I don't trust it. Ananobi was out and Siakam played only 28 minutes due to foul trouble. And the guy that benefited was Boucher. Overall, it was a weird game. We also had 25 Minutes from Thad Young and Hernan Gomez was out of the rotation and Gary Trent was terrible. 10-2-0 on 36% shooting. He's been much better than this, obviously. This is just what happens when you rely upon steals and points and that's that's it. And then when the shot doesn't go in and you have 10-2 with no defensive stats, it hurts. Barnsley had 16-7 and seven with an absolute mega. Richie Benno. Two for two, two, two. Two threes, two assists, two steals and two blocks. While Siakam 19, 6, and 5, and Van Vliet 15, 5, and 7. It was a good game from Young, 14, 4, and 4. I don't really feel like that that's something we need to look into too much. For the Grizzlies, Jar was out with that wrist issue, Stephen Adams with his knee, and Dylan Brooks was suspended. So they went big. They started Desi Bain, and then next to him, Jaron Jackson, Santi Aldama, and Xavier T. Ilman. This is, let's cut to the chase here. This is terrible news for Brandon Clark. We saw as soon as Adams was announced out for those three to five weeks, they went straight to Clark as the starter. He played big minutes. Went, all right, Brandon Clark's the better per minute guy. Let's go at him. And then after about two or three games there, they were up against a really big center. Look, against Gobert, they played Brandon Clark. And he went, all right, I guess matchup doesn't matter. And then we saw them make a switch for Tillman. Oh, okay, it's a big center. All right. Tillman gets to start. And then we said, all right, but against the Raptors, that's fine. Brandon Clark will start because they're up against six foot nine pressure to chew well, no, they didn't. And Clark played 16 minutes, and that is the absolute death knell. Get that garbage out of here! Unless he's going to play... Like if, he's, if he's not going to start two-thirds plus of the games that Adams is out, i got nothing to do with Brown and Clark. Six and five in 16 minutes. Bye-bye. As for Tillman, hmm, 12 and nine, a steal, 32 minutes. I won't say that he's a must-add player. I think I'd rather hold on to my waiver ads, but... We could have three more weeks of Tillman being a starter the majority of the time. Again, I don't know. There's a lot of inconsistency here. So that's why I wouldn't rush into it, but it was interesting. It was also a great game from Aldama, who started at the, at the three. 32 minutes, 15 and six, two triples, four assists, and two blocks. That's two big games in a row. One of those was without Jaron, and one of those was without Brooks. Bear that in mind. So I wouldn't rush to add Santi either, but it was good. Jaron had 18 and 8 with four blocks. That's three games over 30 minutes in a row for Jaron's, which is awesome. While Desi Bain had 26 points, four steals, four assists, four threes, and a block on elite shooting. An amazingly good game. And our Tyus Jones, Jar Morant, luxury stash paid off. Nine, eight, and seven with three steals, as it basically always does. But remember, this is a guy that you might have as like the hundred, the 14th or sixth or six, 14 or 16 team league player when Jar plays and a top 100 guy when Jar's out. Does that make sense to you? It might. 
that's really going to depend on your individual situation. So he's totally fine to, to have on your roster, Tyus, but he's not going to be for everybody. Uh, Johnny Concha only had three points in 18 minutes, while Zaya Williams is dropping very much out of consideration here. Two points in 11 minutes. For some of the guys they draft, and they always seem to be really high in their draft picks, Zaya Williams, David Roddy, Jake LaRavia, they're not going to be in the rotation very much here. They're all sort of pushing their way well out of that, which is which is something to watch, I think. Something to watch. They're not going to hit every draft pick, although they seem to think that they do. Hmm. The next game, the Sixers lose to the Knicks, 108-97. Embiid, 31-14. and Wasn't him. It was the bench that was atrocious in this game. Their starters were all massive positives, and their um, bench players were disgusting. They just got killed. Harden had 12, 8, and 12 with two steals. Both Embiid and Harden shot poorly, so they're not fully without blame. 38% for Embiid and 36 for Harden. And De'Anthony Melton played 36 minutes. Well, that's great. 14, 3, and 3, a steal, a block, three threes, 71% shooting. We really like that. But his minutes are becoming pretty unpredictable. I think he still is a hold, much like Tangles is, Tyrese Maxey, but he stunk. Tangles was a minus 23, almost a team worst. 12 points, 24 minutes. And you know what I'm going to say? If you're not getting big volume and you do nothing apart from score, then you do nothing for fantasy. 12, 1, and 0, no defensive stats, no threes. I'm not dropping Tyrese Maxey, but our expectations should be changed to him not being a top 100 player. He was wildly overvalued in the preseason, you know that. Um, But I didn't expect it to be like this. He'll be better than this, but Jesus Christ. PJ Tucker had double-digit scoring for the first time since November, I think. 10 points for him. While Tobias Harris had 14 and 10, just a middling game. And Harris is starting to become the player that I thought he would be at the start of the year. 111th over the last week. I don't know if he's going to maintain top 100 numbers because when a team is healthy, this is sort of where he sits. Also, Mr. Reliable George Yang was terrible. Zero points on nine in nine minutes. Shake Milton had somehow a minus 26 in 10 minutes. And Montrezl Harrell was a minus 15 in three minutes. They played Paul Reed. He wasn't that much better. Minus 14 in eight minutes. But the bench just was, they just got cooked. Every, every time. On to the Knicks. I, I, I don't understand this. I don't understand what happened. They announced their starting lineup. The game started 22 minutes late, which is just embarrassing. Oh, but you always know it's going to start them. Then don't announce the start time that's 22 minutes earlier. It's so easy to start on time. And then what happened is that two minutes, or play 30 seconds before the game tipped, Oh, by the way, RJ Barrett's doubtful. He's not starting. He's got an illness. What? And then there was some bullshit report. Oh, he was feeling a little bit unwell earlier in the day. And then the illness returned just before tip-off. Did it return? Did it actually return? Anyway, Barrett was out. No, it doesn't mean he's getting traded. So they started Emmanuel quickly. And like he had five points in 28 minutes. And his last couple of games have been very underwhelming. Replacing Brunson, replacing Barrett. Very hard to hold. I probably still would, but it is hard, and I wouldn't bother holding Quentin Grimes in a lot of spots either. This briefcase and this haircut. Like 13 and 3 and 30 minutes is okay. These two guys are cuttable if a waiver wire option appears due to the deadline. Hartenstein, 26 minutes and fouled out. 2 and 4 with a block. Totally okay as a 12-team lead player. It looks like he is getting that run over Sims every game now. As for Sims... You just made the list! 8 and 7 with two steals in 22 minutes. We don't need to hold him... Okay, so let's look at this. Ivan Fournier. 17 points, 24 minutes, 5 threes. Really good game for Fournier. Do we care about this? Not in the slightest. He's out of the rotation. He steps up in a game where Barrett's out. He has played other games where players have been out and he's done nothing. Do not add this. This is not a trade showcase. I'll talk more about that later. This is just a game where he went off and it worked out well for him and it means nothing for the future, I don't think. Randall had 24, 9, and 7, while um, Obi Toppin had 4 points in 14 minutes. One of the most underused lottery picks of all time, and I don't even think he's that good. It just, it's just a weird way of using him. We also got 23 Juice McBride minutes, 14 points, 3 threes. Probably his best game for quite a while. He is only, though, a very, very deep league player. Next game, actually both of these last two games were just huge blowouts. The Pelicans beat the Kings 136-104. No De'Aaron Fox out after um, his partner gave birth. Davion Mitchell started. He played 29 minutes, but continues to be just really bad. 10 points, 2 assists, 1 steal. He's not worth the stream. I thought Sabonis was was terrible, to be honest, in this game. He was a minus 32. They cooked him on defense. This is why when I talk about the Kings, and I say, yeah, they've been really good. It's a great story. They'll make the playoffs. I think they'll get absolutely roasted in the playoffs because of the Sabonis problem. 12 and 11. 
50% shooting. Like, it's not a terrible line, but he was just, they just killed him. Malik Monk's been really good of late. 16 points in 24 minutes. Do I trust it? Not really. The last two games have come because Fox have been out. But he's out playing other guys, but the consistency is not really there. I wouldn't waste an ad on him at this stage. I want to talk about wasting. Keegan Murray. 26 minutes, two points, 14% shooting, four rebounds. He's outside the top 250 over the last week. He's outside the top 150 for the season. He is not a must roster player. He just isn't. You know, you know what I say about him. Where are the steals? Where are the box? Where are the assists? If he doesn't hit his shots, he gets benched. The rebounds are subpar. Like, what does he do? He will have hot streaks where he shoots 45% from three. But as I said a few weeks ago, he was hit 40. I think it was 42% from three from the season. So I don't buy this sticking at all. I, again, we hold to see what happens over the next few days. If he's on my 12-team roster, he's droppable for someone. And the same goes for the pencil, Harrison Barnes. Barnesy. Seven, two, and one in 23 minutes. He sucked. His upside is so low that I don't think we need to hold on to him. Fan of pants, he's probably in the same boat. 10, 0, and 0 for Kevin Herter. He had two threes, but he's like outside the top 200 over the last week, outside the top 100 for the season. I value him more than Keegan Murray and Harrison Barnes, but these guys are very, very fringe type options where there are other guys that they can throw in there. This is a weird game. We got 19 minutes of Matthew Delva Dover for those of you keeping score at home and 16 minutes of Keon Ellis. So I don't think we need to read giant mounts into it, but it is an ongoing pattern for Murray, for Barnes, for Herter. Terrence Davis would have liked to see more from him, 7-4-2. and two. He's a guy that if he gets traded into a good situation, he could have some little, some little burst value. Watch that one. For the Pals, Valanciunas was out, Ingram was out, didn't matter. They started Larry Nance, but they went to Billy Hernan Gomez. Bill played 28 minutes. He had 22 and 16 off the bench. He tends to do this. He's a massive garbage time legend. He loves putting up big numbers, and he cooked Sabonis. Nance only played 20 minutes. They didn't need to go any further there. He's looking like a 12-team, a 10 and 9 with a steal and a block. Well, Herb Jones isn't. Five points for Herb in 33 minutes, a steal and a block. We know he had that big offensive game a couple of games ago. I don't view him as a must-roster guy. Well, Trey Murphy really went crazy. 30 points, six triples, but again, critical view on it. He shot 82%. There was no Ingram. There's no Zion. There's no Valanciunas. He's not going to shoot that well or have that many shots. And he still only had 18% usage. He's a fringe 12-team league guy. He's ahead of Najee. He's ahead of Herb, probably. But he's not must roster. CJ had 24, 2 and 4 with three threes. I was also impressed with Kyra Lewis. He's really starting to look better, which is great. 22 minutes, 11, 4 and 4, 2 threes, ahead of Devontae Graham. Deeper leagues, 30-teamers, 20-teamers. You want to pay a little bit of attention here to Kyra because he is is starting to play um, better basketball. And as, as good as the Jose Alvarado story has been, I think there is still a way more upside in Kyra Lewis with his speed and his ability to attack the rim. I'm not saying that he's a better player who will ever be a better player than Jose Alvarado. There is higher upside for him to be a better player, though. The last game was another blowout. The Wolves 128, Denver 98. This game, this obvious. Denver sat um, Murray, Jokic, Aaron Gordon, KCP, four-fifths of their starting group. The only guy to play in the back-to-back, amazingly, is Michael Porter Jr., Maga Porter had 22 points in 31 minutes. Not much else, but that's sort of what he does. Christian Brown started 34 minutes, 9, 10, and 5. But I think he can throw most of this out apart from the Bones Highland thing. Even this game with everyone out, Bones played zero minutes. I guess when you're a young player who has never really had a consistent role in the NBA and you've sort of been all over the place, um, it's a perfect time to showcase someone for a trade, right? Right? Showcasing for trades do not exist. Even sitting guys out for trades don't exist. Everything is done on a game-by-game basis. Someone sitting out randomly doesn't mean they're getting traded. He might, he still might not get traded, Bones Highland. I'm pretty sure he will. But I'm, I, I, he might not get traded. This might just be, hey, this is a disciplinary thing. You've been a dickhead behind the scenes, whatever you're doing. This might be a disciplinary thing. But both of those things, holding someone out for a trade and showcasing for a trade can't exist simultaneously. People just have different ways of doing it. The showcase one is, is definitely garbage. It's it's complete garbage. Why would it? Why would Alec Burks need to be showcased when we've seen him play for 15 years um, versus, hey, we just won't play Bones Highland at all, but you'll trade for him sight unseen. Like the logic doesn't add up. So just always remember when you, want, when you hear those words, always take them with a grain of salt and go, yeah, but nah. As for Bones, I still like him as a player. In a dynasty league, you might be actually get, able to get him at a really cheap price. 
I don't know where he goes in a trade that puts him into a large role, but someone said, hey, if he went to the Raptors, he's easily their third best guard. I might say he's better than Gary Trent, but he would have a pretty good role there. So he's one to watch just to see what happens. I wouldn't necessarily say stash because there's obviously zero minutes here. Um, but it, it, it is a weird situation. But like, I'm not doing anything here with DeAndre Jordan or Vlako Chancha or Zeke Naji or Ish Smith. This is just a throw it away game. You can almost throw a lot of it away for Minnesota, but what we have to look at is Kyle Anderson, who left again for the second consecutive game with back spasms. This has been going on since, I think, October, where he's had back spasm issues. When he plays, he's a great 12-team league player, but the reliability is just not there. Now, I would hold him through this all-star, or so this trade deadline situation, but it's obviously frustrating. Goose had 20 points in 31 minutes. Jaden McDaniels, 14, 4, and 6. Russell had 18 with 10 assists. Like, strong games right, right across the board here. Gobert, 16 and 8 with a block. Really hard to complain about any of these Wolves players. Good news was Jordan McLaughlin returned after missing 30 games with that calf strain. Two points with three assists. That's a 20-team league guy when you're looking for assists. He's quite a good player. It was also a strong game from Jalen Noel. 16, 4, and 4 in 27 minutes. But, yeah, Anderson going down. Um, Austin Rivers being suspended. I'm not really looking... And Noel being inconsistent as well. I'm not really looking at that as something that we need to do a huge amount with moving forward. Lines of the night. Disappointing those last two games. They're really just bullshit games. Um, Lines of the night. Monstrous is LaMelo Ball. Your waiver wire is Billy Hearn and Gomez. Young gun of the night is Trey Murphy. And the dud of the night is Gaz Trent. Top 10 players today in category leagues. Number one is LaMelo Ball. Followed by Joel Embiid, Miles Turner, Desmond Bain, Trey Murphy... Billy Hernan Gomez, Evan Mobley, CJ McCollum, Darius Garland, and Terry Rozier. Your top 10 players rostered in under 50% of leagues. Bill Hernan Gomez, if JV is out, worth a stream, but we're not streaming. But And the Pelicans only have six games over the next three weeks, including your star break. Number two is Isaac Okoro. Watch that. Nice 14-team league option. Watch it. Santi Aldama, probably not. Boucher, maybe. Maybe Boucher. But I'm still... I have... Again, no Ananobi in today's game, so that that, that uh, helped him. Um, Tyus Jones, we know the luxury stash there. Christian Brown, no, like a weird game. Jalen Noel, not really. Evan Fournier, not really. Dean Wade, eh, deeper leagues. And then Kyra Lewis, hmm, something to watch, but we're not adding him anywhere really outside of very, very deep formats. Your top 10 players in points leagues today, number one was Lamello, followed by Embiid, Miles Turner, Des Bain, Bill Hearn, and Gomez. Evan Mobley, James Harden, Paulo Bunquero, Julius Randle, and Trey Murphy. And guys, that'll do it for me today. A weird day in the NBA trade starting. We've got three, four days until the NBA trade deadline. And don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you're here on YouTube, thumb it up. And leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.